Next up, we have Abigail Hing Huen. She is the author of the New York Times bestselling Love Boat Taipei and the newly released sequel Love Boat Reunion. Is that right? There it is. Okay. Uh, she, wow. She has earned a degree in international business from Harvard, a law degree from Columbia, an MFA in creative writing. Uh, she's worked in Silicon Valley on artificial intelligence. You've, she has an artificial intelligence podcast. Uh, artificial, uh, you've been on Entertainment Weekly, Cosmo, Forbes, Hollywood. My goodness, Abigail, how do you have the energy? Where do you find the time? Uh, I, I just do what I love. I have a blast and I'm so happy to be here to meet with all of you. Thank you for being here. No, thank you for being here. You, you were you were interested and very skilled in so many areas, law, literature, politics, the tech industry. How did you start this love of this, this is a multifaceted, you know, view of the world of how you wanted to experience everything? You know, I, I didn't realize this is the case until I became a writer, but writers are interested in everything. They have, you know, I think I've always just been really curious about the world. I grew up in Solon, Ohio, which had a very strong STEM program. And I actually was very, very heavily involved in math and science as a child. Um, all through high school, I was on the Science Olympiad Club. I actually was the, the president my senior year. And I believe we were the first team that went on to nationals. But even in Science Olympiad, I was also doing things like this program called Write It, Do It which you would actually write about the things that you saw and try to communicate because science communication is also really important. Um, and when I went to Harvard, I studied chemistry, but realized that I actually was more interested in like international relations. Um, and so I find like, as I've just begun my writing process, all these different aspects of who I was have come to bear and, and now are incorporated in, in you know my various stories. Abigail, I find as a college teacher, so many of my students have been forced into one thing. Like, what is your major? What is the one thing you do? And what I love how you describe that, which is we should be well versed in everything and, and curious about everything. Um, how did you become a writer and reader too? Like, were you always a reader from an early age? I always was, and I, you know, some of my favorite books were like the Chronicles of Narnia and Laura Ingalls. So they weren't necessarily STEM books, but I did love high fantasy books as well. Sci-fi, I read some. You know, it wasn't really so much my cup of tea. Um, and I have actually been writing my whole life. I don't really see them as mutually exclusive. And I think when I wrote the Love Boat books, I wrote a book with thirty different Asian American characters, and I wanted to showcase that diversity within the community. So some of them are STEM majors and some of them are art majors and some of them don't know what they're going to do with their lives and that's fine. And what I found over time is that my girly girl, who was kind of boy crazy, she goes on this, you know, for those who don't know about the Love Boat program, it's like it's an actual program in Taiwan where parents would send their kids to learn Chinese language and culture and also to find a spouse. And this is actually a real thing. Um, and that's how it got its nickname, Love Boat. But it ends up really being a summer free for all where the kids kind of just go crazy, um, seeking out clubbing and dancing. But they're really high performing kids. And so in some ways, it's kind of a way to blow off steam. Um, and as I was writing the book, I realized, you know, my really girly girl character who she's there to find a husband. She's totally boy crazy. She's a cheerleader, um, but she's actually a girl in STEM. And she's not what you think of when you think of STEM. And that was actually something as, you know, that really struck me. I'm like, you know, this is a story really worth following and seeing what is she going to do with this juxtaposition of her, of her two selves. Well, well, Love Boat Taipei was a huge, yeah. huge New York Times bestseller, you know, explosion. I think movie rights, right? It's, it did so well. But you yeah. decided uh, you've got a sequel out there now. You brought back a few of the main characters, right? Sophie and Xavier, right? Why did you decide to focus on them for the sequel? Well, when I wrote the first book, I actually wrote it originally from four points of view. So Ever, who's my main my main character of book one, um, Rick, who is one of the love interests, Xavier and, and Sophie. And Xavier is like from a wealthy Taiwanese family. I um, I actually wrote 120,000 words, four points of view, and I realized I had just way too much story for one book. So I had to scrap that whole thing, rewrote the whole thing from scratch. But I had all this leftover story after this, and I realized you know, Xavier's story especially wasn't told. He actually has learning differences. He's got dyslexia that was undiagnosed for many years. Um, but I also wanted, and, I, and I, you know, he had, and Sophie is romantically interested in him in book one. And so I kind of felt like the two of them would team up to do something together. And so book two begins with Sophie going to Dartmouth, recognizing that her summer of trying to find the right guy was a complete disaster. So she's sworn off boys, and now she's going to double down and be the best artificial intelligence major that Dartmouth has ever seen. 
but she is still herself. Like she still loves fashion and clothing. And so what she tries to do is bring together her fashion interests with a project in her artificial intelligence class. And she's actually trying to get in off the wait list. So she really, the stakes are high. She needs to impress the professor. So he's going to so he'll let her in. Um, but he's just not that interested in her project. He's like, I, he has all these questions like about why this fashion app that she's not, that she's trying to build is not going to work. And I found, you know, working in Silicon Valley with a lot of startup companies, that was true for a lot of girls, um, a lot of female female led startups. It was hard for them to get funding. It was hard for them to kind of bring their ideas where they just were met with this wall of skepticism. And nobody realized it was actually implicit bias. Nobody would have said like, oh, it's because she's a girl, but that's what was happening. And so I think with Sophia, I was trying to really kind of show like, hey, you can be all these things. You can be fashion obsessed and and a cheerleader, and you can also be in STEM. Well, I thought she's a really wonderfully written character. I, I enjoyed seeing it through her perspective, and I'm rooting for her the entire time in the novel, I must admit. Uh, you know, you, you answered my next question, which was how you integrated artificial intelligence and you know, all that you've been working with. Uh, I'm curious, do, do you mind, you have a passage from the book you, you could share with us today? I'd love to, yeah, thank you. So as I mentioned, she doubles down at Dartmouth. So this is actually a passage from her first day of the class. It's jam packed with all these people talking about things that she's never heard of. And her professor is very intimidating. He's up on the board. Um, and so here's kind of when class kicks off. A video of Harrison Ford plays on the screen. Han Solo. His gray hair hangs neatly over his lined face. He raises a blue Yeti mug at us. Welcome to introduction to artificial intelligence, he says. You're in for the ride of a lifetime with my good friend, Professor Horvath. I want to personally wish you well as you start the year. Also, I'm not actually Harrison Ford. I'm a deep fake, but I wish you well nonetheless. I laugh with the class as Professor Horvath takes center stage, hooking a thumb in his pants pocket. Well, as my good friend Harrison Ford said, first, a word to those, welcome, as my good friend Harrison Ford said. Now, first, a word to those on the wait list, as I know we have several hundred waiting anxiously. I'm sorry to say we are simply limited by auditorium capacity. I encourage you to find alternative classes but if you're still hoping for the Horvath touch, please audit the class for now and submit your project proposals for the first assignment, which I will tell you about shortly. If spots open up in the next two weeks, I will admit waitlisted students based on the quality of your proposals. A few groans go up. A guy in the seat in front of me heads for the doors. The guy behind me motions to the empty seat. I almost refuse on principle, but I focus better when I can take notes, so I drop into it. This arrangement is actually good for me. If I can jump the waitlist with a kick-ass proposal and I actually have a real shot at getting in. Now onward, says Professor Horvath, AI is revolutionizing everything from robotics to energy to healthcare and everything in between. You will learn the fundamentals of artificial intelligence and how to build algorithms that are changing our world, chatbots that talk to people, tools to help doctors. He launches into a world I've only ever associated with gamers. I type furiously, taking notes like I never have. I Google every other word he says and scan Wikipedia for context. Deep learning, deep fakes, chatbots. I'm going to learn the secrets to unlocking the universe. I'm going to learn magic. I was hoping you would choose that passage too. That was my favorite. <laughs> so, so, so let me build off of that because I, again, I love the way you describe that. How is science like magic? You know, there's so many things that we don't understand still about the universe. Like the universe is just incredibly large. We haven't even penetrated our own galaxy. Um, and I think there's like an incredible magic in that. Like this magic is like things, you know, like things happen, like people levitate or, you know, a wand moves and something happens on the other side of the room. And I think sometimes we see that with science too. There's, um, and, and then when you, when you dig down into the fundamentals of why it does work, um, we often find that there's just incredible, beautiful design at the core of things. And and that to me is magical. Mm -hmm. You mentioned earlier about how, you know, I know the statistics, statistics for college that college now has many more young women than young men enrolled. But how do we get more young women? How do we get more representation in the STEM areas, in the STEM fields? Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting question. Um, when I went to law school, my class was actually slightly more women, but as I rose through the ranks and moved into leadership, the women all started to drop out. And I think there's a lot of factors at play. Um, I, you know, I, as I mentioned, I was actually chemistry at Harvard my first year, and then I ended up dropping out too. And I, you know, I look back on that, that was the right choice for me. 
but I wondered if I would have stayed if there had been other women like me in the class and there just weren't. And so I didn't have friends in my class. I didn't have a community. Like if I went to class and afterwards we all went out for lunch or, you know, you know, went to see the movies together, then maybe that community would have helped tie me there longer. Um, so I think that's part of it. It's just building community where girls feel welcomed. They feel like, you know, this is where I belong and I can do this. Um, there's a lot of talk now, like this is what a scientist looks like. And they have like many diverse faces. And I love that movement. Um, and then I think it's like kind of what I was, you know, addressing in the book, like there's many ways of being a scientist and there is so much um, that we haven't, we haven't explored. So one example um, in artificial intelligence, a couple of years ago, there was this artificial intelligence human resources app that did not correlate women with leadership roles. And, you know, this is actually deeply embedded in the historical data, like women just historically were not getting leadership roles and therefore their resumes, um, even if you stripped out their names and their gender, like the resume still may have reflected some, you know, feminine past, like maybe ballet or instead of football. And, um, and, you know, I think it takes a woman being at the table to even notice that this is happening. And it, you know, just the same way it takes that diverse person at the table to notice, Hey, this AI facial recognition is not working on my darker skin. Um, and so like, I think empowering younger women to realize like they, they have a special and unique voice to bring to a field that traditionally has not had their voices there. We need to change that table. You're exactly right. Mm -hmm. Abigail, back to your book. This is the sequel. Are we going to see another adventure? Is there something else that you're working on? Well, I wish I could share more. I will be able to share more soon. Um, I actually do have multiple STEM books that are, are coming, they're forthcoming, um, that draw more on the world of artificial intelligence, of technology. Um, I have a short story that is out in the world called The Idiom Algorithm. And it's about a, a kid in Silicon Valley whose girlfriend gets kidnapped and he builds an algorithm to find her using idiom. So that again, that's another tie in between like the language um, and, and the sciences. Um, but yeah, I have, I have many more projects that are kind of just coming out of my time in Silicon Valley. I, I can't wait to, to, to see those projects and read that story too. Where can I find that? So that is actually in, a, in an anthology with Macmillan that came out in January called Serendipity. So this is actually the funny thing about my books. Um, they are romantic comedies. And so people don't actually think, oh, STEM or, or girls in STEM. Um, and same with like my short story. It's in an anthology of rom-com, um, YA rom-com stories. But that's partly, you know, I think what I'm doing is like, as girls are reading these romantic comedies, they also find like, hey, and I can also be a girl in STEM and love romantic comedies. I found when I was researching your book, when you go to the to the chat rooms that discuss your book, you have changed so many lives. Everyone oh, okay. says exactly what you're saying there. Like, I expected to read it for this reason, but instead, this is what I found. And it was universal throughout them how many people you've inspired, not only to read a great book, but to truly get involved in these things that are not you know, encouraged perhaps by parents or others. And I, I love that. And again, such an inspiration. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm happy to hear that. And, and, and off the record, you can tell me what's coming next. Cause I, I'm so curious now I'm, I'm hooked. Oh, <laughs> yeah. well, that's thank you. I will say so, the, film is coming. Yeah, the film, we, we wrapped filming. It's, it's all announced. We've Ashley Vala starring as Ever Wong, Ross Butler starring as Rick um, and, and, and a number of other folks. So, I'm so thrilled with the film and excited to share it with the world. When can we expect that? So no date's been announced yet, um, but what has been announced is the casting, you know, yeah. we filmed um, and Lionsgate is on board as our global distributor. And, and Ashley actually was recently cast in The Hunger Games, which is super exciting. I cannot wait. 